a brief story about prison PTSD and how I almost got locked up for a very long time after just doing 17 years in prison. Let's go. And matter of fact, before we go, please keep in mind before you get, oh, this is the guy that tries to give people advice. He almost crashed out. This happened year one of me being home. I've now been home four and a half years. And I'm also the guy that gets up here and talks all about how I crashed out or almost crashed out in hopes that you don't learn from your own experience and end up crashing out and that you learn from mine. That being said, let's proceed. Year one, I remember having to go get a rental automobile. Why? I had got recently into a car crash. I was not at fault. Um, and what was crazy, I was only five minutes from the house. Which, side note, stay on point. Stay on point till you get to get home. Most accidents happen about five minutes, they say, from within the house or whatever. Boom. Didn't think that was true until it happened. That being said, um, I had to go get a rental car. And I remember that day being extremely frustrating because we had called several places only for them to say they didn't have any rentals available. And I had to go to work the next day. And though my wife kept saying, oh, it's okay, don't worry about it. My anxiety level was going up because I needed my job. I want probation, we got bills to pay. We're not rich, I need to be able to keep going. Nobody has a rental car, we live in Atlanta. I did not understand the rental car process. Please keep in mind, when somebody does a long time or a long term of incarceration, they may have to reacclimate into society more than you know, and please don't take for granted the information they be, may know or may not know. I didn't understand the process of how difficult it could be to get a rental car even though I was in Atlanta. I didn't understand why we couldn't just drive up to an airport and get a rental car that was on the lot. I remember we drove up to one rental car place and there was two rental cars there and I asked them why can't we get those and they said they were already taken. Cool. In that transaction, I had made a phone call to a place down the street, a rental car place. They had allowed me to book an appointment and I was grateful. The pressure was off me. We had been looking for four or five hours for a rental car. Finally, this is no exaggeration, finally found this place. We go there. I'm chilling now. You know what I'm saying? I can feel the AC again, even though it's hot outside. My anxiety's coming down. The pressure's going down. I'm gonna be able to go to work tomorrow. And we get there. We walk in and the gentleman, the manager, uh, asked me, you know, what can I help you with? I said, I have a reservation um, for a full size sedan. My name's such and such. I'm just here to pick it up. I'm so glad that you guys have this rental car because I've been looking everywhere and I really got to get to work tomorrow. And it's such a burden not having a vehicle in Atlanta. And he looked at me just like this. And he said, our apologies, sir. We don't have anything available for you. And immediately I said, well, that's not true because I already booked an appointment. We booked that. I did that on the phone with one of your reps and I was told I'm good to go. He immediately, immediately says, well, I'm sorry. They should have told you otherwise. That's not how it works. Now, my wife is trying to give me the gentle tug at the shirt and defuse the situation. The gentleman had walked away. Um, because I had asked him to double check at this point in time, but my wife seen me getting agitated and she explained to me, she said, babe, just because we were able to book the appointment, like I told you, it doesn't mean they had the vehicles available. Let's just go. That's what she said. But at this point in time, I'm engaged. I'm engaged in the conversation because with me asking questions, he was looking at me like I was stupid. And I say this respectfully, but there's customer service has dwindled over the years. So now i'm more focused not necessarily on the fact that they don't have a vehicle though that's extremely frustrating but now i'm back in prison mode where i feel like this guy is trying to talk down to me belittle me etc this is an issue i have not gotten therapy yet i'm back in that mode i start to sweat and not because it's hot outside we're standing in an ac building right now at this moment in time i had begun to shake this is what it felt like. And now it wasn't no outwardly like super, but I could feel it. My heart rate was starting to increase. I was back in fight or flight. But then again, in hindsight, maybe I had never left that place. And that trigger of him just looking like he was talking down to me, which maybe he wasn't, but I think he was, was enough to send me possibly over the edge. Now, thankfully, I had my wife there who was speaking to me. Thankfully, I wanted to stay free. But put somebody else in that situation that doesn't have support right there, a voice of reasoning, and ask yourself what could possibly happen. I was still angry 
frustrated. I felt like his company had lied to me. I didn't know how to emotionally process and you're talking down to me like I'm stupid and I should know better. I don't know because I've been locked up for 17 years. And mind you, he started to get rude. And when he mentioned that, I mentioned the 17 years in prison thing, which is totally wrong. But I used it to tell him I didn't understand the process. You'd have to forgive me. It was sarcastic uh, overtones indeed when I mentioned it. But um, it did cause or evoke a certain response. Now, I want to be clear. Luckily, another young lady that worked there walked out. She kind of intervened with my wife, de-escalated the situation, which is horrible that as a grown man at the time, 36 years of age, had to have somebody de-escalate a situation in a rental car space. But I'm the transparent guy that's going to tell you your loved one coming home from prison can be easily triggered from something that seems minute. You may look at it like an everyday interaction, but the moral of the story is if he's gone through that enough times or seen it in certain places where it's not condoned and he's had to live a certain way where it had to be checked immediately or he would be seen as weak, he still may be running in that mode. So I hope y'all are listening. That is not the only story I have related to that. And that's why I run around speaking and teaching about emotional intelligence and talking about a men mental health resources, etc. But I can tell you, um, my goal with telling this story is that you learn. Me and the individual, before I left the place, I did apologize. My wife asked me to apologize. I love my wife, that's what I did. Um, I had stepped outside. Um, you know, he said he, you know, he understood. He gave his apology or whatever. If I, if, he had offended me and that was it but man how many situations go the other way how many situations go left instead of right more of the story is and be on point ptsd is real especially when your loved one's coming home from long-term in confinement or confinement period especially after a long period of time it again is like somebody a veteran not comparing war to prison prison to war but the trauma it's similar and there's triggers and there's things that will send them over the edge if they're not doing work in a certain place or getting healing. Thank you.